Open your Bibles, if you would, please, to uh, the book of 2 Kings, Old Testament book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 4, and uh, we'll be looking at the context of verses 8 through 37. I won't have time to preach everything I'd like to preach out of here today, uh, but there's a, a wealth of information and a wealth of knowledge and blessing and encouragement that you would find if you would choose to read it after the service and, and reflect upon some of the things that I'll have a chance to bring out today. But in Second Kings chapter 4, let's read, please, starting in verse 17. If you're there, say Amen. amen. If you love the Lord, say Amen. 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 Second Kings chapter 4 and verse 17. And the woman conceived... And bear a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father to the reapers. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to a lad, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. Go down to verse 26 with me. Elisha sees her coming and sends his servant Gehazi. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her. And say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. Any time that God gives a blessing, a promise, or a purpose. Listen. Any time that God brings into our life a blessing, it's always something we couldn't work for, something we didn't earn, something we didn't deserve. Or perhaps He gives us a promise. He speaks something. And when God speaks something, it always comes to pass. When God gives a blessing or a promise or a purpose, you were founded before you were born in the mind of God with a distinct purpose. And that purpose in the mind of God for you will never change. It was ordained before you were born. It was established in the mind and the heart of God before you were born. We just don't know what it is. We're the ones trying to discover the blessings of God and the promises of God and the purposes of God. And as God brings these things into our life through a variety of circumstances and situations, they are always placed into the crucifix, if you will, of testing. If God has given you a blessing, if God has given you a promise, if God has revealed to you a purpose, that blessing, that promise, that purpose will be tested. And your faith in regard to what God has brought you will be tested. Don't consider it a strange thing. The fiery trial that is to try you. Don't consider it an unusual thing. When God gives you something and then asks you to believe Him for the supernatural so that it might happen or stay with you or come to pass. There's a fight of faith involved in embracing a promise a blessing, and a purpose. And every one of us is in the process of 
some form of holding to something that God has given us. Holding to something that God has promised us. Holding to something that God has purposed before we were born. We're in the crucible. And as we study this event in the life of a woman who will forever, as far as we know, remain nameless. We can learn. We can gather strength. We can be encouraged today by the faith of the Shunammite woman. And that's the message I want to preach to you today, the faith of the Shunammite woman. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You for the opportunity to preach Your Word, to pro- proclaim Your truth from this sacred desk. And Father, I would ask humbly and with all sincerity that the preacher would come, the teacher would come, the one who makes preaching and teaching easy, and that my mind might be focused on His voice, that I might say exactly what You desire said to Your people today. And I would ask as well for an anointing to rest upon the congregation for the next few moments that that which is needed in their hearts might be revealed to them by the person of the Holy Spirit. And Father, we take authority right now over every hindering spirit, over every force that would stop Your Word from going forth and stop Your people from receiving this Word that will move in their hearts and be a stalwart for them for this moment forward. We'd ask it all in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. I want to talk to you this morning for a few moments about several great things that I see in this text. And while I'd like to stop every time I get to a new point, I really am not going to do that today. But there are four great things that we see that we can grab from the text. And there will be many others that we could grab. But four that I feel the Lord has made obvious to me that I'm going to talk to you about. And I won't tell you, well, now I'm going from point one to point two to point three to point four. I don't think. So I want to lay out before you where I'm going before I get there. I want to talk to you about a great woman and what made her great. The Scripture says she's a great woman we're going to be talking about. We're going to talk about a great blessing. And we're going to talk about a great trial. And we're going to talk about a great restoration. I want you to know if something has come against you, God has not ordained it to be over. It's a time of testing, not a time of ending. I wish you would talk to me this morning. It's a time of testing, not a time of ending. You're going to have to go through something to come out of something. You need to go through something so that you really understand what it means that, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, when you go through something that is heart-rendering, that is mind-boggling, that is just unheard of in your mind or spirit, and Jesus walks with you, you don't come out weaker. You come out stronger. It's not all about just the destination. It's about the journey. You gotta to learn to love the journey. You gotta to learn to embrace the road. You've got to learn to not be weary in well doing, but say, God, I've got to learn whatever it is that you're bringing into my life through this situation. We've got to learn that what we've heard preached for the last 50 years is a bunch of hogwash. God doesn't save you and then give you everything and say, now just be blessed and be a blessing. God's interested in changing our wicked, evil hearts and conforming conforming them into His hearts. And we don't get there quickly or easily. Just the salvation experience won't get you there, even though it's required. Just the baptism with the Holy Ghost won't get you there, even though it's needful. Just going through something won't get you there. But if you hold to Jesus... He'll take you from the beginning to the end. But i got to have somebody that will walk with me today. 
We don't want to get changed. We don't want to be constructed. We don't want to be varied or altered. We just want God to come in and be in a fixture on our dashboard and make us feel good about going to church. And that's all the God I need. But Jesus didn't die to be a fixture on your dashboard. Jesus didn't die to just have an hour of your time on Sunday morning. Jesus died to radically come inside of you and change everything about you and me. Change the way we think. Change the way we act. Change the way we walk. Change the way we talk. He doesn't want us conformed into the image of one another. That's what religion does. We all look alike. Dress the same way. He doesn't want you religious. He wants you conformed to the image of Jesus. So on every... I'm just trying to make a simple point. On every individual basis, you're going to have to go through something. You've got to go through something to find out how wonderful He is, how powerful He is, how magnificent He is, and how faithful He is. You're going to have to learn how to trust Him for yourself. You're going to have to know that it's not Brother Swagger or Brother Larson or Brother Donnie that you need to call when you get in trouble. You've got a hotline to heaven. I'm a gift to help your faith, but don't call me when something dies. You gotta get to Jesus. And you gotta know that you have access. And you have to understand that you are important enough to God to take you through something you don't like so you can learn more about Him. Oh, I'm preaching better than you, amen. And life in in Christ is all about that. It's not all about get comfortable, give me a raise, make me happy, bless me, give me more money. God can do all of that, but that's insignificant to Him. He wants us, you and I, conformed into the image of Christ, and it will only take 100% of your time and the rest of your life. So if you're not in for the journey, you might as well hit the door now. I don't have time to mess around. I'm in for the long haul. I found He's good in the morning. He's good in the afternoon. He's good in the evening. He guides me through every issue. He's never let me down. He's never forsaken me. He's never left me. And yet we, we go through things and we're such babies. We're so spiritually inept because of what's been preached to us for years and years that we don't realize it takes a supernatural strength that I don't have to get me through the journey. I'm working at it. We have to learn to receive that. In the midst of what God is doing in your life. Wherever you are, it's not far enough. Wherever you're going, it's not far enough. Wherever He's brought you, it's not far enough. You've got to get this down into your heart that the Apostle Paul exhibited, and that was this. I press. I wish I had someone in here that was pressing this morning towards something other than a turkey. I press. I said, I press. You can sit if you want to. I'm going to press. I press for the prize. There's a prize out there. You know what it is? It's more righteousness. It's more holiness. More righteousness. More holiness. I don't need another car. I need my heart changed. I don't need another house. I need my spirit conformed. And if and when God adds those things, wonderful. But what I need is what I'm pressing for. We need to grow up. We're not in this thing just to get stuff.
Waste all that time on stuff that's going to burn. I like nice things. When I got saved, it, I was a mess. Lived in a truck, in a tent, in a garage, anywhere they wouldn't throw me in jail. God's given me a wonderful family and a home. He's given me wonderful kids. Well, most of them. <laughs> given me a wonderful wife, and she is wonderful. And my kids are too. And of all the things He's given me, the most important to me is the constant change that's happening in my heart as a result of what Christ died to do for me at Calvary. I'm not the same man I was a month ago. And if that process ever stops, take me home. I need it. I want it. It's what I desire. I want to be like Christ. And I'm not trying to mimic Him. I'm not trying to copy Him. I want His life through me. I want the supernatural flow of Jesus in me. And the truth of it is, this flesh and this will and this mind won't get out of the way until I go through a few things. It's God's way of getting us out of our comfort zone and addressing us. Hey, let me just clue you in. God's not trying to change your neighbor as much as He's trying to change you. He's not trying to change your boss as much as He's trying to change you. He's not even trying to change your wife as much as He's... It's me, O oh Lord. It's me, O oh Lord. It's me, O oh Lord, in the need of change. I'm not talking to people that aren't saved. I'm talking to people that have started off on the journey and wondered why hasn't it been easy? Why hasn't everything gone well? I'm just trying to give the background and the introduction and the thought process for this simple message today. And that's this, that you've got to go through some things to learn how powerful, how wonderful, how faithful He is and how useless you and I are. Without him, in, without him, I'm nothing, and there's no good thing in me without him. And I, he proves it to me every time he takes me through someone. Touch someone on the shoulder and tell him I'm going through something. Touch him on the shoulder. Don't be bashful now. Y'all just reach out and touch somebody. It won't hurt you. You need to get to know them anyway. Just tell them I'm going through. I'm going through. I'm going through. I'm going through. Now, what kind of person has to go through a test? What kind of person has to go through an issue? What? It's not somebody that's not saved. God's going to take somebody that knows something. God's going to take somebody that has already experienced a little bit of His grace, a little bit of His mercy, has a little bit of knowledge. And this woman here is one that stands out in my mind as someone who is already in relationship with God. And there's some evidence of that. First of all, the Bible says that she is a great woman. Now, literally, the word great indicates wealth, that she has finances available to her, that she has money available to her, that, that either she or her husband, and they work together in what they decide to do, which is the way it ought to be, uh, you work together. I don't, I don't have time to pastor this morning. You work together. And so they work together with their money and use their funds for the work of God. But she's wealthy. But in the, in the term great, there is also the connotation in Scripture of something more. The term great is also used to describe Boaz in the book of Ruth, who is certainly a person who is great in the sense of wealth, but there's spiritual knowledge there. Job is referred to as the greatest man of the East. He was wealthy, but there's a spiritual maturity or ability to mature when we see that word at times. Not every time, but there is. And I feel that as I look at this woman, there were several things that made her great. Having money didn't make her great. The church preaches that today. Well, if you have money, that proves your faith. No, I would beg to differ. The Bible says, according to the book of James, that it's the poor of this world who are rich in faith. 
that are really making a difference. The problem with men with money is that they begin to trust in their money. Or their ability to make money. Or their ability to maneuver money. If many of the body of Christ uh, got money, I'm afraid they do what most of the body of Christ does when they get blessed. They stop coming to church and buy a bass boat. We'd never see them on Sunday because they'd be traveling with the blessings of the Lord. Because they don't yet understand that if God gives you something, it's not just so you can hoard it to yourself. It's so you can give a little bit of something back. But she's wealthy. She is even spiritually, I think, on track, at least to a certain degree. And how much of that is true, I'm not certain. But we see that she responds well. First of all, not only does the Bible say she's great, but I want you to know she was a giver. Now, shout now. Amen. She was a giver. Look at your neighbor said she was a giver. She was a giver. Let me tell you something. The body of Christ needs to hear this and hear it clearly and loudly and proclaim it. And preachers, you need to stop being afraid of taking up an offering. I rebuke that spirit. That is wrong. You need to understand that the one who gives will be far more blessed than the one who receives. God is able to make all grace abound toward you in that you will have all sufficiency in all things. Who's that blessing for? The giver. God is able to make all grace abound. Preacher, when you understand that when the people give to the true work of God, your need will in fact be met. But the greater blessing will always be to the giver. And you and the body of Christ need to quit being afraid of being robbed. And you need to think on those terms. That is the biblical process that you need to think about. Are you applying for an offering? No, I'm going to do that tonight. I am. I'm going to ask you to give $1,000 tonight. I need you to start praying about it now. Some of you can give 5 Some of you can give 10 Some of you can give 15 Some of you could give 50 And you need to think about it. And let God work on you. Oh, it's getting quiet now. You're thinking, hurry up. I like that press thing better. I'm not afraid to take up an offering because I know that no matter what you give to us, it will in no way match what God will return to you in the way God wants to return it. God is able to make all grace abound. This lady is great because she's a giver. She has money. She has finances. She has something at her with with disposal. And she's great because she fights to give it. Elisha is passing by, and the Bible says she constrained him. That means she wouldn't take no for an answer. Elisha, you're going to eat at my house. Elisha, I want to be a blessing to you. Elisha, I have an offering for you. No, I can't do it. Elisha, I need you to come to my house. Elisha, I want to feed you. Have you ever met someone that couldn't wait to give? You all need to shout with me a little bit this morning. She is great because she's utilizing what she has, and her motivation is not for any other reason but that she wants to bless the work of God. She's looking to and wanting to and making Elisha listen to what she has to say. Elisha, I just want to be a blessing. Elisha, Paul had the same problem with some of the Macedonians in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. They gave so much he had to say, no, 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 I, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't take it. I know your state. And they said, would you shut up and take the money? You need to get the right attitude about our money. It's not all about so that we can hoard it. He's given it so we can give it. And you can't outgive God. I'm just trying to tell you that. You say, well, you're trying to get an offering. I'm trying to get you blessed far more than just meet our need. And that's how God works. She constrained him, the Bible said. She constrained him. And finally, he stops. He's on the road of Shunem going to Carmel. A place we don't know what he was going to do there. Perhaps pray. Maybe he's on a circuitous route of preaching and teaching uh, in a northern kingdom that has by and large forgot God and forgot who God is. But here's a woman who recognizes a man of God, recognizes the work of God and says, I want you to receive what I have. I want to be a blessing to you. Now, I noticed that her husband didn't jump up and give in the offering. But her husband, I want you to know this, her husband was the recipient of her faith. He received the same blessing she did. I don't have time to stay there. 
And she comes and she comes to her husband. She says, you know what? Now that we've had a chance to eat with him, now that we've had a chance to meet him, now that we've had a chance to get to know him a little bit, you know, I perceive. This is another thing that made her great. I perceive this is a man of God. Not only was she was a giver, she was discerning. You need to be a discerning people in this hour and in this day. If you want to be like that great woman, you're going to have to be able to discern the difference between what is spiritual, what is carnal, what is fleshly, what is devilish, and what is of God. You say, well, I'm not here to judge. Sir, ma'am, if you're born again, filled with the Spirit of God, and you've got the knowledge of God's Word, you're the only one qualified on the planet to evaluate something. You have an anointing from God, and there's not anything that any man needs to teach you in regard to what's right or what's wrong. You have the person of the Holy Spirit to give you guidance. You have the Word of God to be sure in your heart that what is being said, what is being done, is of the Holy Spirit. Because it's conforming to the Word of God. You've got to be perceptive. You've got to move past your own preferences and ideas and let God do whatever God wants Him to do. Let God do whatever He wants to do, and sometimes that's difficult. This woman was willing to say, God, just show me what is of God and I'll support that. And she said to her husband, you know what? I perceive that this man is a man of God. And we've been having him over for supper. You know, I determined a long time ago that with me, what you see is what you get. I do not wear the mask of Christ. I am not afraid for you to come into my home, come into my office, be a part of my life, because what you see is what you get. Like it or not, this is it. I heard a long time ago a preacher say, well, and I, I didn't like it then, and it's not true now. He said, well, uh, you don't need to get too acquainted with the people because they won't like you. Now, I'm not going to take every one of you to my house. I know that. But I'm not afraid to get to know you. Come on, someone help me here. Because what I am and what I have is what Jesus did on the inside of me. And if you're spiritual, you'll recognize that. I don't have to put on a mask. I don't have to talk like you want me to talk. I don't have to even dress like you want me to dress. I can be who Jesus has made me to be. I can be comfortable with that. And I don't have to compromise what I feel and what I think in order to appease you or to make you believe I'm spiritual. I'm just what Jesus has made. And thank God for that. And that's what you ought to be too. Some of you just need to drop the mask of religion. Every time you come to church, here it comes. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. You don't talk like that. That's not real. That's what you think I want to see. I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear it. And you, when you meet a man of God, you ought to know it's a man of God. Even if they don't act like you think they should act. Even if they don't walk like you. Even if they don't dress like you. you got to have enough perception in you to know that's a man of God. Because the Spirit of God in you bears witness and the Word of God that that man or woman is proclaiming matches up with the Bible. Whether you like them or not. I don't know why some people don't like me. I'm a nice guy. But I'm not here to be liked. I'm here to love you and be a gift. And if you're spiritual, you should recognize the gifts that are among you. You don't worship them. They're not the issue. A gift that's right and proper won't point you to himself. He'll point you to Christ. And she says, this is what made her great. She says, you know what? I perceive that this is a man of God. And what we've been doing has been good, but let's do more. Let's do more. Let's do more. In fact, let's give him our best. And so she suggests this, let's build a house on the top of the roof so that whenever he comes by, he has a place to sleep, a place to rest, a place. Let's give him our best. God doesn't want a tip. He wants your best. 
And I'm not just talking money. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about your life. Don't just give God 10% of your time. Don't just give God 10% of your heart. Don't just give Him your best. This is what made this woman great. The rooftop was a, was a place to be envied. It was a place for a great home. They didn't have A.C. in those days. So if there was a breeze that would roll through, it would oftentimes be best on the roof. The rooftop was one of the best houses. It would have an access that was not necessarily from within the framework of the house, but built on the side of the house so he could come and go any time of the day or not he wanted. And they didn't use it. They set it aside for God and said, this is for God. They built their best and gave their best to God. These are all things that made her great. She used what she had. She was a giver. She uh, was consistent. She was persistent. She was discerning. She gave her best. All of these are attributes that you and I ought to have. The man of God receives the blessing, and one day he's lying there in the room, and he says to Gehazi, go get that Shunammite woman. And it's interesting in the text that he doesn't really talk to her directly. He talks to her through Gehazi. And she's standing at the door, and he says, ask her what she needs. And she, she's not looking for something. This is one of the things that made her great. She's not thinking, aha, they finally recognized me. Brother Swigert finally recognized me. I've called these so many years on the radio phones, and he finally, finally recognized who I was. Tell that woman, what does she need? Speaks to her through Gehazi, even though the indication is she's just ten feet away. Does she need me to talk to the king? Man, there's a little bit of political maneuvering. Does she need me to talk to... The head of the army, got any neighbors you don't like? Having trouble with your boss on the job? We'll remove him. She says, you know what? I've got everything I need. I am really content. I, I live at peace with my people. And this is another thing that makes her great. She's content. Let me ask you something. Are you content with what God has given you? Are you content, pastor, with the 15 people you're pastoring now? If that's all that you ever have. Are you content with the home and the car? If you will, you serve God if nothing ever grows anymore. Or will you look at God and say, I'm a failure and God, you're a failure. Because you've evaluated success in the worldly sense of the mind. She's content. She says, I have what I have. I, 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 don't, I, I didn't do all this to get something from you. So she leaves. And, and Elisha says, Gehazi, what is it that she needs? He says, well... The only thing I noticed that would probably be a drawback is uh, they don't have any kids. No kids. And her husband is old and she's not getting any younger and no kids. And in the Eastern culture, man, no kids was a slap in the face. It was like a curse from God. People looked at it and said, oh, we're not, you know, no matter what we had, if we didn't have any kids, nothing to carry on the family name, then we didn't have anything. And, 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 and ladies, I don't mean to be insulting, but girls were good, but a son. Woo! I'm talking to grandfathers and great grand. I better go over here. In that culture, you know, you, it, the perfect family was seven sons and any number of daughters, you know, because the sons would carry on the family line. And so in that culture, a son was really something. They don't even, they don't have a girl to love. They don't have a, uh, they don't have a son to love. They don't have a child to love. And in the heart of every Mid-Eastern uh, individual, and especially in the woman, you know, her whole life would surround being that vessel through which the family line would continue. And so from the very beginning of her life, uh, as she comes into early adulthood, she's thinking, I'm going to be a mom. I'm going to be a mom. I'm going to be a mama. I'm going to be a mama. I'm going to carry on the family. I'm going to... And that's what she's got in her mind. That's what she wants. And year after year after year, disappointment after disappointment, uh, you know, she couldn't just run out and get a pregnancy test. But I imagine that as time went on and she saw some evidence of her being pregnant, that she'd wait only to be disappointed, not one time, but again and again and again and again, until finally the lack of children had become just a low, throbbing disappointment in the back of her mind and heart. And probably she had resolved herself to say, It'll never happen. Man of God says, call her back up here. Get her back up here now. 
<laughs> He's kicking back on the bed that the giver gave, <laughs> that the consistent, persistent, discerning individual gave. And he says through Gehazi, tell her, a year from now, she'll be holding her own son. Tell her. Tell her. See, some of you have got some things in your life that God planted there, and it's never come to pass, but it's something you always... You longed for it. You hope for it. You sought God for it. You thought, God, is this the hour? Is this the time? Is this, is this the moment? And all of a sudden, someone says, and I'm not saying it to you, only God can say it to you, but someone says to you based on that, you know what? You're going to get it. Come on, someone help me here. You're going to get it. And, you're, and, and just how you just responded to me just then is how she responded to the prophet. Can this be true? Don't play with me. Don't mess with me. I'm a bad woman. Don't play. I want to. Don't deceive me. Don't lie to me. Could it be true? Oh, geez. Could it be true? Let me tell you, when God comes up and gives you something that is so great, you could never ask or think. You'll respond the same way. You haven't dared to believe for what God can do in your life. I'm here to tell you this morning, dare to believe. There's more. There's more. Dare to believe. I can't speak into your life what God alone can speak into your life. But I can tell you, dare to believe Him for the impossible. Dare to believe Him for the innermost depths of your heart has beaten for something for the purpose and plan of God all your life. And now God is telling you, get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready! Get ready! God's going to speak something to you. And when He does, don't doubt it. Say, yes, Lord. Say, yes, Lord. Don't hide from it. Don't doubt it. Don't run away and say it can't be so. You say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I wish I had a yes, Lord audience. I wish I had a yes, Lord witness. I want you to know that He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think. And when He speaks that word to you, don't you back up. Don't you sit down. Don't you give up. You say, yes, Lord. You say, yes, Lord. You say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. It looked like my ministry was over. It looked like I'd never do nothing for God. And God told you to get up off your log and get up out of your sorrow and make your heart right and go preach. It'll never happen. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. What I ever thought I never could have. What I never thought you could ever bring to me. What I never even imagined. You've now spoken. And sure enough, said, said, sure enough, a year later. Man, you know what? Can I, can I, when you get pregnant, it don't just all of a sudden show up, poof out, and pop out. <clears throat> For a year or nine months, God will be confirming His Word to you. Your belly's going to get a little bigger. Someone help me here. What's that? That's the promise of God. What's that? That's that building God said they'd give me for my church. What's that? That's that family member God told me that I never thought would be saved. What's that? That's my daughter that's not living right. What is that? What is that on the, what's that on the inside of you? What promise is God awakening in you this morning? What promise is the Holy Ghost saying? Believe me, in just a little while, it's yours. Honey, you're pregnant with the Word of God. 
and down through the time that you're be prior to your delivery, that pregnancy is going to work in you. It's going to move in you. You're going to start getting bigger. You're going to have to change your pants. And you know what? Another thing that made this woman great, she believed him. She believed him. She believed him. And a year later, the evidence of the Word of God was there. A great woman and a great blessing. And we don't know how many years it was, maybe four, maybe five. The evidence is he's a little shaver. Man, a son. Carry on the father's name. He obviously keeps pretty close to mom. But that's all right. That's what they ought to do. I love my kids. I want them close to me. I hug them every day, whether they want to or not. Joseph's six foot and he'll be embarrassed, but I still hug him. He's my son. Now, until he ties me up and throws me down and says, I can't do that, I'll do that. <laughs> And if you could help with the grocery bill. He's six foot and 13. I'm telling you, it's a, but I love my kids. I love being around my kids. I love watching my kids grow. I love watching what God is doing in their lives. And I know this mother felt the same, even though the little guy, I don't know, we're not told how old he was exactly. We can only guess. But he's old enough to be carried by his mom, so maybe he's 50 pounds, maybe he's five or six years old. And just about the first time that he thinks he can, he's big enough to go out with dad. Goes out with dad into the, into the field. Man, he's having fun. He's ripping, he's running, he's driving the servants crazy. How do you know? I have a boy. He's getting into everything he shouldn't, everything he shouldn't get into, he's gotten into. I mean, he's throwing the servants for a tizzy. Some of you just never had boys. He's doing everything that a boy does. He's out there ripping and running and having fun. And the next thing you know, too much sun. And he screams and grasps a hold of his head and says, Dad! My head! My head! And the father doesn't know what to do, so he sends a servant and Sends the little boy back to his mom and she picks him up, 50 pounds of promise, 50 pounds of God's love and sets it on her knee and rocks him and holds him and speaks gently to him. And all of a sudden, she feels the life go right out of him. About noon. still and everything in her goes no 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 she shakes him to see if he's shaking or if he could be revived she shakes him tears begin to roll blackness begins to envelop her mind. Her, her, her heart is up into her throat. She be, gets dizzy all over. What do I do? A promise. A blessing I didn't ask for. It's dead. Something I never thought I'd ever have that I always wanted, and now it's dead. What am I? But something on the inside of her said, it's not over. I didn't ask for this. I didn't work for this. God gave me this. And if God gave me this, I don't believe that God would let it just die. See, when something supernatural is given, it will be supported by the supernatural faith that is not accompanied when we lose things we've worked for. When it, it, it doesn't come this way, when it's something that you did, but when it's something that God did, even when it looks like it's dead, you can expect 
God to do what's unexpected. You can expect the impossible. I can't explain it, but I've had it. That gift of faith that looks dead right in the eye and says, dead will live again. That looks dead right in the eye and says, that debt is not taking me over. It's not taking me under. It's not destroying my ministry. It's not, how do you know? I don't know. It looks dead to me, but something on the inside of me. I wish I had somebody to live by faith in here. Something on the inside of this Shunammite woman would not let go of the blessing, would not let go of the purpose, would not let go of the promise. So she takes the lad and takes him up onto the bed of Elisha and lays him down on the cot and says, Man, I need to make a journey. I gotta get to, I gotta get to Carmel. I, I, runs out to her husband, gets one of the servants, grabs one of the donkeys, tells the servant, after she gets done with her husband, her, her husband, and this is, you know, God help him. He, yeah, well, what are you going to a preacher for? It's not Sunday. Well, what are you going to a preacher for? It is not a new moon festival. What, what, what do you, what do you, he's as spiritual as a box of rocks. Doesn't have a clue. And so she doesn't fool with it. She doesn't ridicule him. She knows that he needs something that he doesn't even know he needs. And so she just says, look honey, it is well. See, nobody else will understand what you've got to go through. Nobody else can get where you are. No one else can stand in your shoes and take your place. You've got to say, it is well. It is well. Because sometimes when you tell your husband and you tell your wife what God has said, they say, let's just go have a funeral. Let's just go bury it. Let's just go forget it. Job's wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? But something inside her said, it is well. It is well. It is well. And she looked at that servant as she sits on the donkey and she says, You beat him and you hit him and you don't stop because that's how they did it in that days. The servant would get behind the donkey with a stick and hit him and make him move. And she turned around she says, Don't you stop unless I tell you to. Fifteen to twenty miles. Some of you are on a journey right now between Shunem and Carmel. And you're trying to get, you're trying to get, you're trying to get, wait a minute, I got good news. You're not headed to Carmel. You're not looking for Elisha. You're headed to Calvary. Hey, you're headed to Calvary because you don't need a prophet. You don't need a preacher. The only one that can fix your problem is a man with nail prints in his hands. The only one that can do for you what you need done is not your preacher. It's not your psychologist. It's not your doctor. And it's not your friend. You've got to get to Calvary. You've got to get to Calvary. You've got to get to Calvary. Why? Because right there, Jesus paid for everything that you need. Your faith has to make a journey from Shunem, the place of rest, to Calvary, the place of the cross. Even Carmel is known as the garden. You're headed towards a tomb. You're headed toward the answer. But it's not in a man. It's in your God. And His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And man, you got to have the same attitude. I don't care what they say. I don't care how they talk about me. I'm going to the cross. I believe the answer's in the cross. Go ahead and beat that donkey. And don't you stop. I don't care what they think of me. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what they say about me. I'm going to the cross. I know the answer is there. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to desist. Something inside of me says, if I could just touch Calvary. My problem will be resolved if I can just get to Calvary. My issue is going to be handled if I can just 
believe that what Jesus did at Calvary. Man, I'm not trying to get to a 40-day purpose booklet. I'm not trying to get to a government of 12 meeting. I'm not trying to get to a cell group. I'm not even trying to get to the studios of Sun Life Radio. I'm trying to get to Christ Jesus, the Son of the living God. And you've got to be just like that great woman said, drive it, drive it, drive it. Every time we preach over Sun Life Radio, when we say it's the cross, we're behind you, beating your donkey. We're behind you saying, don't you give up. Don't you quit. We can't do it, but we know one who can. Every time you preach the cross to your people, you're driving them to Calvary. You're taking them to the Zion, sir. You're taking them to Christ. Come on, preacher. Drive it. Drive it. Drive it. Well, I don't want to hear it anymore. They need to get beyond all that. Fine, then let your promise die. But my promise shall live because I'm going to Calvary. I don't care what anybody says. And when they get close, you'd think that Jesus would run right down off of his throne and meet you. But he sends Gehazi. You're going to have to get past a few servants who want to take the credit for what God alone can do. But you don't need a preacher. Finally, she gets to Elisha. Elisha is a type of grace. If Elijah was a type of law, Elisha is a type of grace. There's no greater manifestation of grace than what Christ did for us at the cross. She falls down and grabs a hold of his feet. If you've got a great blessing, you're going to go through a great trial. But get to Calvary. Let your faith go there. Trust in who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And i got to hurry. I'll finish this up as the singers, musicians come back. Elisha finally gets to the house himself. He climbs up to the room that was prepared for him. And there on the bed is the child. The promise. The Bible said he laid down nose to nose. Fingers to fingers, feet to feet. He became, it's not up here, it's not up there, it's up here still. He became one with the child. He became one with the child. When you're born again, you become one. You, with Christ, you are baptized into Him. You are immersed into Him. Your answer is not out there. You're already in your answer. It's not in your confession. It's not in your works. It's not in your effort or your quotation. It's a result of being in Him. And you've already got that. You're so much in Christ. If you just swing your elbows, you'll get ribs. You're in Him. He's not a thousand miles away. You're in Him. He's not apart from you. You're in Him. Placed in there by the Holy Ghost. He baptized you into the body of Christ the moment that you said yes to Him. And now your faith, which has been on a journey, just needs to reach out to Calvary and know that I'm in Him and He has the answer. You become one with Him through your faith. You're in Christ and all the benefits... Whatever benefit you need can be yours when your faith, which is under the gun, travels to Calvary and you're one with Him and He is applied to your problem. The Bible says the boy sneezed seven times. And got up. And Elisha said, there he is, Mama. Take him. 
But, Brother Larson, I traveled to Calvary. And I didn't see a great restoration. I traveled that road and I didn't see a happy ending. I've been under the gun. You know what? If you still believe, you haven't lost. You've won. If you still believe, you haven't lost. You've won. Philip Horatio was a man of God who loved the Lord, lived in Chicago in the 1800s. After the Chicago fire, I think of the 1880s, and maybe I have my dates wrong. He and his wife and four children, four girls, decided to travel to Europe for a vacation. His wife's health was not good. And right before they left, he had a real estate situation come up and he had to send them in front of him. He said, you go forward. I'll meet you there in a few days. As that ship that that wife and four children were on neared the coast of England, another vessel rammed it and it sank in 12 minutes. Four daughters were drowned. The wife was found unconscious, floating on debris from the wrecked vessel and taken to England where she cabled her husband back in Chicago these words, saved alone. Horatio would take a boat, a steamer, as quickly as he could to England. And about the place where that vessel floundered and went down, the captain called him to the office. said, Mr. Horatio, this is the place. About here, some 300 feet below, would be the remains of his darling four daughters. Philip Horatio would go to the bow of the boat, take pen and pencil, pencil and pad, and write these words, when peace like a river. Somebody give me a hymnal. Find it for me. Attendeth my way. When sorrows like See, billows roll. Whatever my lot, he has taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And I don't know if you've got to believe God today for a restoration to take place, or you just need to believe Him because you've been through something that you don't understand. I'm here to tell you that if you'll place your faith in the Christ who loved you and gave himself for you, if you'll surrender that, the heartache, the despair, and if God has placed that faith in you for restoration, hold to it. But right now you're on a journey and you just need a little help. Stand with me all over this place. You're on a journey and you need a little help. You need that peace that passes understanding in your heart and your life. I want you to make your way down to this altar and let God sing it to you. It's well. It is well. Come on. Peace like a you got to believe God for something. you got to move through that issue. Take it to the cross. Take it to Calvary. Every hurt, every pain, every sorrow. He can do it. Come on, you're coming to Jesus, you're going to Calvary, he can meet that need, come on, push in, now I need the rest.
rest of you to come behind. I want you to stand and believe. These need your help right now. Come on, just a few moments. Give these people some help. Love them as they push through to Calvary. This podcast has been a blessing to you and you would like to contribute to this ministry. Feel free to contact us at 1-800-288-8350 or you can go to our website at www.jsm.org. We love you. God bless you. My cross, I